So the second half of our panel tonight um, has uh, other scientists and researchers. And um, I think we'll let our moderators, our three moderators, do the introductions now. Okay, so the first person on our second part of our panel is Mariani, and she is a field engineer with a computer science background working also at the Broad Institute. In her role, she works as a technical consultant for researchers and scientists in the Broad Institute's data analysis platform called Terra. She also aids users to the use of Terra to the fullest creating features or scripts that will help them aid them in their scientific goals. She is also a founder of STEM for All Brockton, a program geared to introduce and teach STEM to children and low income families in the Brockton area. She also teaches computer science and engineering at the Boston Public Schools to fourth and sixth. On the weekends, she is a Sunday school teacher and a youth leader at her local Haitian church, and her passions are coding, teaching, and helping the community. All right, Mr. So I have Lee Tharps, and Mr. Tharps currently serves as the Regional Process Engineering Lead for the U.S. North Region of Jacobs OM Division. His primary goal goal is to ensure that each of the region's water and wastewater facilities are operated efficiently and meet their treatment goals. Additionally, he develops engineering solutions to address any issues as they arise and directs their implementation. Prior to this role, Mr. Tharps served as an engineering consultant in Jacob's Water Business segment for over 10 years. I will be introducing Megan Cassidy. Megan is a lifelong Brockton resident. She graduated from Brockton High School when she discovered her where she discovered her passion for science and the environment. Megan graduated from Northeastern, Northeastern University with, with a Bachelor of Science in Geology. Through Northeastern's University Co-op co program, Megan had the opportunity to work at several, several intern positions focused on biology, geology, and hydrogeology. For the past 30 years, Megan has worked in the Region 1 office of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. During this time, Megan has worked in several positions focused on hazardous waste cleanup. Currently, Megan is a supervisory environmental engineer and oversees scientists and support staff who identify, investigate, and clean up hazardous waste sites under the federal Superfund law. When not working, Me Megan enjoys spending time with her husband, two grown children, and extended family. She also enjoys hiking, golf, reading, and traveling to visit, visit national parks. Okay, so I'm gonna start off the second panel with asking a question to all three panelists. And if you remember in part one, I asked Dallas about any advice that she would give to any um, students whose experiments didn't go well. So I just wanna open up to the three of you guys. I'm gonna, I'll restate the question. Um, uh, something that I've overcome as a high school student studying science is being okay when experiments doesn't go well. So I was wondering if you can speak on any times in your perspective fields where either an experiment of yours or even a colleague's didn't go well and any advice you would have for students like me who do research projects when experiments doesn't go well. Who should start? Anyone can start. I'll go ahead. Um, so, I mean, I think the most important thing uh, to think about when an experiment doesn't go wrong is what you can draw from that. Um, you know, I, the the you know the goal of an experiment is to 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 prove out a hypothesis, and if you can't prove it out, there's usually something to to gain from that. Um, a, a good example, you know, I, I work in, in, in the water quality field, and so oftentimes, you know, I'm presented with issues um, related to, to either treatment failures or um, something not going the way I want, and oftentimes, if, if what I'm trying doesn't work, um, I try to analyze the data and really see, you know, what, what happened um, and, and, and put on my thinking cap to really uh, come up with a, an alternate 
uh, solution. Um, depending on the, the situation, if this is uh, you know, more academic, um, often you can write up these results um, and, and many people will, will get a, a certain amount of, of information from those results, whether the, the experiment was quote unquote successful. Hi all, this is Megan Cassidy, and I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I just would reiterate what all the other panelists have said about um, failing. Uh, you know, the scientific process is about asking questions and figuring out solutions. So we're, you're never going to answer all the questions on the first go round. That's just what science, technology, that's just part of the process. So you should never be afraid um, to fail because it's not failure. It's just part of the process. Um, and in fact, I think, you know, if you look at some of the greatest scientific advances, you will read the history and most of them were preceded by many, many failures or attempts. Uh, perhaps you should stop using the word failure because it's not. Um, it is a, their attempts. So uh, if you want to, you know, sort of proceed, I think, in the STEM field, get used to the phrase or the thought process of asking questions and finding solutions. Um, but again, you're not failing. Uh, you know, if, if all the answers were that easy, there wouldn't be jobs for all of us, to be honest with you, you know? So that's part of the whole STEM arena. Uh, and I would just ask that none of you use the word failure, but rather exploration. Yes, I agree with everyone else in the panel that failure is a part of life and it, it's hard. I know for coding, even though this is not really the question, but I'm more familiar with coding apps and websites and things like that. Um, when I have failure in coding where what I'm trying to make does not work or does not come out the way I want to or a lot of other problems that come with coding in different languages. I always like take a step back and realize that it's okay because what I'm doing is new. No one else discovered or if it's something someone else discovered, someone else struggled to. So I'm just another person making history or another person figuring this thing out. So I know I'm not alone in the world when I make a mistake and that helps me calm down and try to rebase and figure something else out. Thank you, panel. That was such insightful answer. So I'll pass it on to Yvonne G. Thank you, Isabel. So Mr. Tharps, on your LinkedIn profile, it says you're a water treatment consultant, you're regional process manager and operations management and facility services. How's the transition to your new job and what were big differences you noticed? You are muted. I'm on mute, sorry. Way. So that's a, that's a very good question. Um, my new role is uh, just about four months uh, into, the, into the process. Um, my former role, I, I worked um, as a consulting engineer. And so I, uh, I went out and worked with our various clients, most of whom are uh, municipal entities, municipal um, water and wastewater utilities, different cities, um, to help them solve problems that they were having um, with their facilities, with their, their drinking water and wastewater treatment facilities. Um, and generally speaking, um, we would try to come up with a, a, a plan to address their problems, and uh, we would then deliver those. Uh, my, my new role is kind of overseeing the operation of uh, almost 20 different facilities across the sort of northeast portion of the of the United States. And one of the biggest challenges is just um, kind of keeping track of, of all of those those different uh, projects that are going on that I'm working on. Um, another really big challenge is uh, the variety. Um, you know, we operate facilities in 
um, New England and we operate facilities in the Midwest and they're, they're very, they're just very different. They have different um, uh, treatment goals. Um, the environment's just a little bit different, different rules. Um, and so it, it's a challenge to, to kind of, you know, keep, keep all of that clear. Um, but um, because, because it's new, um, I'm, I'm putting my head all into it and um, it's been really exciting, definitely. Very interesting. All right, I will now pass it to Stephanie. Hello, um, the next question is for Megan and it's climate change has been a big issue for many years. It's already had observable um, effects on the environment. Glaciers have shrunk, ice on rivers and lakes and is breaking up earlier. Plants and animal ranges, animal ranges have shifted and trees are, are flowering sooner. Effort, effects that scientists have predicted in the past would result from global climate change that is happening now. What can what do you think that we can do to address this issue? That's a great question, and um, you know I think every you know the vast majority of people believe that you know the science is clear that uh, you know we're facing some significant issues related to climate change. Uh, the wildfires out west you know, incredibly, you know, it is, these things are related to climate change. Um, I think we all can do the little things, you know, consider less fossil fuel, try, you know, the, from what we can do individually, um, you know, try to have a smaller carbon footprint. And, you know, there's a lot that other people above all of us need to do. Um, you know, much about climate change relates to, you know, science policy that has to come from our leaders. So, you know, we, we have to support those that, you know, recognize and trust the scientists. Um, you know, all of you are future scientists and, you know, people need to understand the experts on whatever it is, medicine, environment. So I would ask that you be open-minded when people provide information to you. But again, there are little things, you know, reduce your carbon footprint. Um, you know, that, you know, again, it's a very big issue, something that each and every one of you here, I hope in your future careers, are going to help improve and solve um, the issue for all of us. Thank you, and I'll pass it on to Isabel. Thank you. So my next question is for Mariani. And as I mentioned in your introduction earlier that you are a field engineer. So I was wondering what your typical schedule looks like for being a technical consultant working with um, different scientists and researchers at the Broad and maybe what are some pros, of con pros and cons of working with so many different people at the Broad? Yeah, um, of, as the field engineer, um, I think it's better to like broadly explain field engineer real quickly. Um, field engineer could be any major. So you can, I have coworkers that are neuroscience, researchers, doctor in physics, and I happen to be computer science. And we are all come together to connect scientists to the, um, the technology we use. So there's computer engineers working on the actual technology where ours is a data science platform that does um, different analysis for cancer and different um, diseases. And I'm lost in thought, sorry. But my job as a field engineer and other field engineer is to bridge the gap between the technology and the scientists. So in my day to day, I talk to different scientists, different um, companies and just different co-workers around to talk about what scientists are doing, what additions we should have to Terra, which is our analysis platform, and what should I do to help that bridge that gap. Sometimes a good example is when a scientist wanted to do cancer data on a dog and Terra platform only had data for humans. So we code up something for Terra to add to Terra. So 
when they put in the dog cancer data, they were able to do all the functions in Terra that you would do for human for a dog data. So we add additions to Terra if needed. And most of my days meetings are coding. And some pros and cons for that is pros is it's always changing. That's why it's like a lot of explanations at once. One day I'm coding, one day I'm talking to this scientist, another day I'm talking to a company and some, and I love that because I don't want to be stuck on one thing. I always wanted to code all my life. Well, not all my life. When I got introduced, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want to stay in one spot and code in one project or one game. I wanted to do different things. So this job gave me the ability to go and try and talk to different people, see different research projects and code in different languages because some scientists need Python, some need Java, some need um, other languages that I never heard of and had to learn on the spot. And I think that's a great pro if you don't know what you want to code. Um, a con was, um, I'm not that good at biology. <laughs> I love chemistry, I love physics, it's just biology is just, just not the one for me. And, it's, and even though it was really hard for me in school to learn biology, I meet a lot of people who are biologists and chem bio. And so talking to them, I have to try to remember the little that I remember from um, biology class and a lot of Google, a lot of Google, <laughs> like little things here and there. But I feel like I'm learning more about different things in bio and genomics and data. So it's also a pro because I'm learning a lot from other people. Yeah. All right. It seems as though uh, Blake Denius has arrived. So I would like to, so Blake serves as the entomologist educator for Plymouth County Extension and his responsibility is to deliver evidence-based information that members of his community can count on and hopefully show people how much there is to love about the bug row. Because insects and arthropods affect our lives in many ways, from house pests to stinging and biting insects to butterfly watching. A scientific understanding of entomology can lead to sound management practices effective personal protection, and higher respect for nature. Blake graduated with a bachelor's degree in biology from University of Massachusetts, Boston in 2009. Motivated by a desire to help protect the environment, Blake began a career in ecotoxicology. During this time, he helped to run, develop, and troubleshoot hundreds of studies. Some of the study methods he helped to develop are currently being used worldwide for ecotoxicology work. In, in 2017, Blake left research to begin his career as the entomologist educator for Plymouth County. And I have a question for you, Blake. Of course, yeah. So, um, so when I read your LinkedIn profile, it included a publication you made titled Risk Assessment and Aquatic Macrophytes, a Method to Test Six Species Individually and in a Laboratory Setting. Could you please explain what you did? Sure. Um, thanks, thanks, Ivanji. I'm, I'm Blake, by the way. Uh, just joining this. Sorry, I'm late. I just came from another presentation. So in any case, the... Uh, kind of save people from being too bored. Ecotoxicology can be a fairly dry subject, but basically what it boils down to is anytime you go into the store and you buy, say, a bug spray for yourself, or if you were to buy suntan lotion, any of these kinds of things, um, the risk is that some of the stuff you're spraying on your body or spraying or using uh, just in general, it, it contains some kind of chemical. And so we always worry about what damage that could cause to the environment. And so one of the things that we were studying in that particular publication was uh, the effect on aquatic plants. So what happens if some of these products can get into our waterways 
how are they going to affect plants? Because, you know, if they affect plants, that's going to damage any fish that feed on the plants. It's going to have a whole cascade chain of chain reaction and going to really impact things down the line. And so that was really what we were looking at in that particular study. Uh, I believe we were looking at a few different kinds of plants and how different compounds affected them in different ways. Uh, it's, it's one of those things like, it, you're sure you might be testing for one plant, but what do you, you know, what if you're testing something on, uh, we were testing like American eelgrass and like something called Maryophyllum, uh, just a bunch of different kinds of plants because they are all going to react differently. Oh, that makes, that clears up a lot of things. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I have a question for all four of the panelists, and it's sim and sim and exactly as I said earlier, if you didn't choose this career, what career would you have chosen? Well, this is Megan Cassidy, and I heard this earlier, hey. and that was easy for me. Uh, I think I probably would have been a science teacher. Hmm. All this, right. is, uh, this is Blake again. Um, one of the things that I feel very fortunate to have done was try two real different, very different careers. And maybe I can kind of speak on that and that might help people make a decision. So when I went into research, for instance, that was really fun. Uh, there, was, there was good and bad about it. It was really, really cool to be doing things that no one else in the world was doing. Some of the stuff that we were working on as I, as I kind of mentioned, you mentioned in your introduction, some of those test methods are now being used worldwide. And you get to really study and learn about organisms before anyone else knows it. So if you're going into research, you're almost, you almost feel like uh, maybe uh, the old world kind of discoverer is kind of tracking new lands and you're really pushing the boundary of what people know and that can be very, very exciting. But on the other hand, uh, what can be very frustrating about working in research is there's very long hours. Uh, there, you know, I've got one coworker now. She said she was working 70 hours this week. And I was like, you know, that was a regular thing that I, I used to do because studies don't stop. Science doesn't stop. Things keep going on and on. And as you get older, that can, that can get kind of tiring. It can kind of wear on you. Um, the pay, the pay is, doesn't really keep up with the amount of effort and energy you put in. And uh, as you get better in research, what, what you find is that it really pulls you out of the lab setting. And so I started out doing all the work, like hands-on work, running these studies, taking care of all these organisms. And as I started to get more experience working in it, I got pulled out and did a lot more office work, a lot more report writing, a lot more study design, a lot more interacting with clients. And that to me was less fun. Uh, now in my current role, I'm an educator. So I just read other people's work. So it's not as, I feel kind of like more like I get like, instead of being a sports player, for instance, actually playing like football, now I'm someone like an, a, a sports newscast, a sports caster, where now I'm watching other people do it. And uh, that's, I get a little bit jealous, a little envious of people doing the work now, but at the same time, my hours are better. I get to interact with people, I get to teach people. And it was a really good shift, at least now in my career. So I kind of, there's good and bad. Like one, the research is very, very exciting, but educating people and teaching people, spreading that information and knowledge can be really equally rewarding um, as long as you can kind of cope with uh, the thought that you're not now on the cutting edge, you're, you're reading other people's work. And um, so that's kind of the, the pros and cons, at least to the two different jobs that I have right now. All right, Mary, Mariani. Mariani, um, my answer is a little bit not the normal answer, but I want to be honest with you guys. <laughs> if I was not in um, STEM, I would be a housewife because, <laughs> because um, my mom and all the other moms in my neighborhood were all like housewives and the dad go to work. And I thought that was, that was good. Like I'll stay home, cook clean, and then money would come to me. But the it's okay to be a housewife not, not knocking them at all it's really respectable but the thing is the problem with sorry the problem with it is that it's because I saw all the other women in my life become a housewife that's why I wanted to be a housewife I didn't know STEM I didn't know computer engineering I didn't know I knew there's a doctors but like I didn't want this blood I don't like blood but like 
like I didn't really know anything else in STEM. So I didn't aspire to be something I never seen before. And that's why I think things like this is so important because you get to see different engineers, you get to see different things in STEM. So you can choose like what you want to be. And that's why I'm happy to be here. Mm, and finally, you, Lee. So not to, not to be unoriginal, but um, I think maybe one of the sort of characteristics of people who often work in STEM fields is an interest and a desire to uh, share their knowledge with others. And so, you know, very early on before I really got started in my career, I did AmeriCorps. Um, and I was actually doing uh, work in New York City for the Parks Department teaching um, uh, ecology programs to, to school age children, to, to, to small, small kids. And I, I really enjoyed that. And, and as I've progressed in my career, um, some of the things that I've gotten very excited about are uh, you know, sharing my knowledge and explaining things about my job to either my coworkers. Um, in my current role, I do a lot of training for um, our operations staff. And so I think if, if I had to pick another career, it would probably be some, some sort of, of career in education uh, in, the, in the science field. Um, my uh, academic background is in chemical engineering um, and environmental engineering. And so, you know, a lot of chemistry, biology. Um, and so, you know, teaching those subjects, I think, would actually be pretty great. All right. Thank you for all your answers. I will now turn it over to Stephanie. Hi, so my next question is for Megan, and it's how do you feel about big corporations getting away with polluting the environment with such lenient environment protection laws? Well, that's a great question, because that is exactly what I do on, you know, every day of my life. Um, working in the Superfund program is all about cleaning up um, wastes. So sometimes it's illegal disposal. Sometimes it's just the way materials were handled, you know, 20, 30 years ago, no one knew any, any better. So they buried it. That was just standard practice. So, you know, there are some uh, corporations and responsible parties, as we call them, that were, you know, sort of doing it from, you know, just ignorance, if you will, and others that were doing it out of malice. So, but regardless, my job and our program, the Superfund Law, does uh, require that we go looking for those companies and we we work very hard to get them to do the work to clean up their past mistakes. And sometimes they do it voluntarily. Well, maybe not voluntarily, but a little bit, you know, rather willingly when we reach out to them and they want to work with us. Sometimes they don't. Um, and then we have to get involved in some legal, you know, sort of negotiations and battles with them, which um, is kind of, it can be very interesting. And that is an example of where, um, as a scientist at, at the Environmental Protection Agency, you often are working on, uh, with a team of people with various backgrounds. So, you know, you might be the scientist working with an attorney who's going to try to go after these, you know, a company to get them to, to, to clean up their, you know, the waste that they polluted the groundwater with. Um, and that's really interesting. It, the, it's great to work on teams like that, multidisciplinary teams to sort of solve a, you know, a problem because again, it's not just the scientist or the engineer who comes up with figuring out you know, what needs to be done, but how do, you, how do you do that? So you work with various people. But, you know, generally, that's what I've done my whole career. And, uh, you know, again, uh, some companies and some of the, you know, contamination that we see was not put in place or deposited uh, maliciously, but rather, you know, we didn't know any better at a certain period of time. Um, and, you know, working with the companies that are good stewards and want to, you know, help do their responsible thing and clean up, it can be very rewarding. Um, and sometimes when you have to go through a legal battle, that can be very uh, interesting as well, because, you know, sometimes I've been in a situation where I've had to go to court as an expert witness and use my scientific knowledge to inform people about, you know, what's happening. 
and again, that's just really interesting part of using your expertise, your technical background in different ways. So there are lots of ways that you might be able to use um, your expertise if you go into a STEM, you know, into a STEM career later in life. Thank you. That's very important. And I'm going to pass it on to Yvonne All right. Thank you. My question is for Lee. And it is that I remember the incident in Flint, Michigan in 2014, which was six years ago. And this was when there was lead in the water. So as someone who works with water and and wastewater daily, I think the water polluted, and what measures would you have taken to prevent this from ever happening? Um, you know, the, the, I'll call it a tragedy. You know, the tragedy in Flint was, was, was terrible. Um, I mean, I think a lot of things went wrong there. Um, I would say that probably one of the biggest things was a lack of communication um, and a lack of, um, uh, of yeah, I mean, at the base of it, a lack of communication. Um, you had a lot of things, um, a, lot of, a lot of different competing interests um, in terms of, you know, getting um, large, you know, infrastructure projects done and, and making sure those were, were pushed ahead on a, on a fast schedule. Um, you know, as far as remediating, you know, there's a, there's a large infrastructure problem in this country. You know, Flint, Flint was a, the, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, um, to a, a much larger issue. And that is, um, you know, as a country, we have not spent the, the, the adequate amount of money on infrastructure over the, the, course of the 20th century, really. Um, and so, you know, how, how do you fix that? I mean, it, it's going to take a lot of, of very talented, you know, scientists and engineers, really, to, to, to come up with solutions, um, how we can, you know, bring our infrastructure uh, into the 21st century. Um, you know, I, I think it, the, the, Flint, the Flint issue um, I think was, as I said, it was a tragedy, but um, it was something that has really opened the eyes of a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, I think at, since we're talking about STEM careers, it's a great opportunity to just talk about um, that sort of side of, of you know, the, the E in the, in the STEM, the, the engineering and, and all of the work that, that goes into building our roads and our drinking water and our wastewater systems. Um, aviation and everything else um, that needs to be uh, to be worked on. So does that answer the question? Mm, yeah, I, I could. Yes, in a way. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. And now I'll pass it to Isabel. Thank you. So my next question is for Mariani. And I found, I found uh, it so cool and interesting that you founded your own STEM program, which is STEM for All, to help students in, introduce them into the STEM field. So I was wondering, what inspired you and how did you come up with STEM for All, especially how you mentioned earlier, you started out in an environment where all the women in your life were housewives. Um, yes, so when going into high school that was i went to um o'brien um and they just that year when i went into 11th grade they created ap computer science and i asked my uncle who was a computer engineer at the time if i should take ap computer science and that's the first time i took a coding class and i realized this is what i want to do for the rest of my life i love java i love coding this is what i want to do so i end up getting a full ride to the same college my uncle went to and going and that is wentworth institute of technology and going into that um college um, there was two things I noticed in a lot of my classes. I was the only black per 
person and I was the only female. And it really messed with my mental health because I didn't see anyone that looked like me. I, it got better now, if you guys are wondering. Now it's a little better. It's, it's, we still need more diversity, but it's a little better now than when I went. But um, yeah, so I was the only female and a um, black person and it really messed with my mental health. And then one day it was like particularly bad. There was a, my professor gave us um, a sheet of 20 prep questions to do of coding and I was stuck in number two. It, they gave us two hours to do it and it was an hour and a half in and I was still stuck in number two. And I was just like, and that's when all these bad thoughts came to me. Like, I am not smart enough. I do not belong here. That's why there's no one that looks like me here. I'm already afraid to raise my hand because I feel like I'm representing all womankind and my whole race. And I was like really scared and I didn't want to be there at all, but I, I didn't want to fail. So I rose my hand and asked the professor to come. And the professor came and helped me with number two. It was like a weird button that it was hard to find after doing some code. And once I pressed the button, it made the sound like do to do. And then all of a sudden, all around the whole classroom was like do to do, do to do, do to do, do to do. And then I realized everyone is stuck on number two. It was not just me. And then I started thinking that if it's not because of how I look like, or it's not because of who I am and I do belong here, why isn't there are more people that look like me here? And that's when I started um, drawing, become an educator of STEM education because I realized I would never be in STEM if I was not introduced to it. And people can't aspire to be what they never seen before. So I wanted to spread STEM education to um, high school, middle school, and elementary as early as possible. So at least in the end of the day, if a child choose not to be in STEM, it's not because of their race, gender, background, income, um, or anything that's blocking access to STEM education, but it's because they choose not to. So that is what drove STEM for All in Brockton and drove the STEM for All mission. Wow, thank you so much for that answer. So I'm gonna pass it on to Stephanie. Uh, the last question is for all panelists, and it's um, how would you describe your career and how would you describe your career and what you do to someone small like a toddler? Uh, well, this is Megan. Um, and that, that's really interesting because uh, not just toddlers, sometimes, you know, explaining it to other people is as difficult. Um, frankly, the toddlers sometimes get it a little bit easier. Um, I, I kind of explain what I do as, you know, cleaning up the mess, cleaning up the spills, you know, just like when something gets spilled at home or, um, you know, that I have to figure out the best way to clean it up and make it better. Um, and of course, the whole goal in doing that is so that everybody has clean water to drink um, and, you know, areas, clean areas that they can go outside and build houses or play or things like that. But yeah, I just usually say it's like when someone spills something, someone has to figure out how to clean it up. And that's what I do. Um, this is Lee. I would, <laughs> I've actually had this conversation um, with my nieces and nephews. Um, so on the, on the drinking water side, I, I make the water clean uh, so people can drink it. Um, and on the wastewater side, um, often, you know, <laughs> I take my, my niece to the, to the bathroom and we flush the toilet and I say, you know, we have to make sure that gets cleaned up before it goes back to the lake or the river. Um, and so, yeah, I, I keep the water clean both for drinking and, and for going back to the aquatic environment. This is Blake. Um, in my current role, I, I'm an educator, so I just really just tell people, even not just toddlers, but people who might not necessarily know what entomology is, I usually just say I teach people about bugs. And that's usually good enough. And sometimes I get a question like, what good are bugs? And 
I'll tell them how bugs like interact with people on many different levels from the ones you don't want and the, the ones you want and the ones that impact our health. Uh, it's one of those things where it, it's kind of a cool job where you, you can, a lot of people don't like them. And then that's what makes it a good job is that it's, they're, they're complicated and a lot of people don't know things about them. And that makes you very valuable. And so anytime you have that situation where you know something that a lot of people don't know about, um, that, that, that's something that you can market. Um, and so for me, it was, it was bugs. <laughs> oh, I'm still picking on my answer, but I think basically holding hands with people, like I'm holding hands with the computer science. Oh, that's a big word. I'm holding hands with the man with the computer and a scientist, like, who's doing discoveries, science discoveries, and making a full circle. We all hold hands because together we make discoveries and change. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And I'm going to pass it. The last question, I believe, is to you, Anji. All right, this is for Blake. And it is, um, what is your favorite insect to study and why? My favorite insect to study? Um, that's a really tough one. Um, it's, what, it's, it's crazy. I've studied a number of different things, that primarily honeybees, um, and they can be really rewarding. They're really fun. Uh, did some work with lace wings, which are kind of small green insects. Uh, ladybugs and um, wasps and mites and now I you know I do a lot of tick surveillance um, to be perfectly honest I had there's good and bad things about all of them it's just such a complicated world but having spent so much time with honeybees I might have to go with honeybees and, and that if maybe not my favorite but just near and dear to my heart I've just put so many hours and so much time into into understanding them that uh, it's hard to to kind of think about where I would be without the work I had done in honey, with honeybees. So I would, I would have to say that. Thanks for, that's a good question. Thanks for asking. <laughs> All right, I will now pass it on to Isabel. Okay, so um, before we conclude our panel tonight, I just wanna open it up to all the attendees to ask any questions to any of our three panelists. You can either ask it in the chat or unmute your mics. Okay, I see a question in the chat and it says, is there any aspect in STEM which you wish more people would talk about? Wow, that's a really tough question. Uh, whoever gave that question, that, that's a great question. Um, I think maybe following up from the last um, panel or the first panel, I think, you know, more people would talk about the need to expose more people to STEM um, and to the possibilities of what you, your future could look like in STEM because, you know, we've hardly talked about mathematics, but engineering, I mean, it, the universe is incredible um, if you have a background in STEM, the kind of opportunities that, that are out there for, for people. So I think just more communication or more exposure, it's not just sitting in a lab and doing research, which is incredible work. And that's, you know, so important, but there are so many professions. There's coding, uh, you know, uh, you know, writing code, there's, you know, mathematicians are, and economists are, are needed in the business world. I mean, there are so many careers and I think people, you know, kind of automatically go to a very sort of uh, narrow view of what you might do in, um, you know, with a career in STEM. So I think maybe just, you know, more discussions like this. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna say right now because, you know, this is probably my last opportunity to speak. I am so impressed by uh, this group of moderators. Um, you're giving me inspiration about our future. 
And, you know, to see that there are 20, you know, there were some 30 uh, participants in this, you know, on an evening, you know, you're not in school hours. This is your time. I am just incredibly impressed with all of you and this effort. But I think just exposure, because again, um, it's not just the, chem the bench chemist or, you know, that person in the lab. That's not the only job you can have. You've seen so many differences and there are countless more. I mean, you can do almost anything with, um, you know, a background in STEM. Every industry out there requires somebody with a STEM background to run their business. So there, you know, the, the jobs, the opportunities are countless. Um, and I think we just need to do a better job of continuing to let people know that. I, I, I would just, I would add, I think, um, Megan, that's a terrific, terrific uh, commentary. And I would, just, I would simply add that, um, you know, if you are interested in STEM, to, to keep your options open. Um, you know, the, the, the field is so broad and there are so many opportunities. And a lot of the fields are interrelated. And so, you know, getting, getting a multidisciplinary, um, you know, education that really, you know, keeps your options open, I think is important. Um, and I will also add um, that, you know, STEM is super important, but to not uh, neglect the other subjects um, that also inform, um, you know, our, our, our careers, um, you know, they, they open additional opportunities and also just provide a, a different perspective on problem solving. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's a STEM event and I think you know, STEM careers are, are terrific, but sprinkle in some, some of the, the things that, that keep, um, that, that, you know, keep your, keep your mind, um, you know, the other half of your brain working, you know, your, your music and your art and your history and, and, and writing is another thing that I think um, we often, we often neglect, so. Just as a kind of example of what Megan was talking about is that, uh, Right now I serve as the entomologist educator and who even thought like a job like that would exist, right? I work for the county. I just teach, go around to schools and different programs and I just teach people about bugs, these things that I really love that I collected when I was a little kid. And I followed that same career path that Megan was talking about after college. I went into that lab, into that research lab and that was fun for me, but um, it's cool knowing that there's so many weird little jobs and I see them all the time. I see people go into forestry. I see people go into all these different things that you don't even know that that job even exists. No one tells you there are no adults that, that when I went to school, people just said, do what you love, do what you want to do. And someone will pay you for it. And that's not right. That's not exactly true. Cause I met some people that one kid, he majored in fun. He wanted to be like a party planner and just wanted to plan people's part and he didn't do so well, but. Um, and at least I was lucky enough that I love science and that worked out for me. But um, going on from that research job to now doing this job where I, it's a really funky job, a really weird niche. And I'm happy. I'm really grateful to have it. So it, it's just kind of cool knowing that there's weird stuff out there. Yeah, I agree with everyone else in the panel. It's like not, it's like the thing I would tell others is that it's so many different things you can do with STEM. Like field engineering, I never thought I would be in a major where I can do something new every day. I thought I was gonna code. I love coding, but like I was like, I'm gonna code in the same thing every day and not talk to anyone in a, like a cubicle. But my job, I talk way more than a normal computer scientist because I'm always talking to different people. So you like you can take things that you know and like like for example if you love biology and but you don't want to stay in a lab you can be a project manager and like manage a lab like there's so many different jobs you can do based on things that you love and mix them up and like your life is endless and possibilities endless and i think another thing i don't want to forget is that we do need more diversity in STEM. So that is something else that I with someone and I wanna make sure you guys know we do need more diversity in STEM.
All right, do we have any more questions? Um, I have a question. Um, does what is the study of insects? So entomology is it, they usually consider that the study of insects. Entomology is, comes from the word meaning like to cut segments, and so that's kind of really what they're studying is things that are like divided into segments, and so that's it's a really broad. Uh, Insects make up about 77% of all animals. I always joke with people, I say, you call yourself an animal lover, do you like insects? And a lot of people say no, but how can you call yourself an animal lover if you're excluding 77% of all of the, those, that group of animals? And so uh, it's really broad. If you ever wanted to study insects, there's, you know, there's people who just study ants. There's people who just study honeybees. There are people who just study grasshoppers, who just study butterflies. And even the people that study butterflies, sometimes they just study one species of butterfly or one species of ant, you can get really specific because uh, it's just really diverse. And honestly, I didn't think people, when I was growing up, people were like, how are you going to get paid to study bugs? Like who cares about bugs? But I'll tell you this, they, if, you ever, if you've ever been to Disney World, there's no mosquitoes in Disney, but Disney is built up on a swamp. And the reason that people like going to Disney is because there's no mosquitoes in Disney. So there was someone there that figured out a way to design those buildings and design that architecture who understood mosquitoes and could prevent them from being there. And so that's one of the things, like you're always gonna get paid. Insects are always gonna be something that people don't like and they're always gonna wanna get rid of them. And so you're always gonna have a need for an entomologist. So don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't make any money with it. It's, a, it's a, You can make a lot of money with, I don't make a lot of money as an educator, but I made a lot more money as a researcher, but it's um you can make good money as it. And finally, uh, arthropods, right? How would you explain what is an arthropod and their exoskeleton and their mm -hmm. molt, like how they shed their skin? It's a really great question. It's all a matter of how, uh, basically the tiers of things. So right? you're a human being, but you're also a mammal. And then you're also a vertebrate. And so that's the way you want to think of it. So an insect is also an arthropod. But an arthropod includes anything like a crab. A crab is a crustacean, so it's going to include things like that. It's also going to include things like a centipede. A centipede is not an insect, but it's also an arthropod. And so they're all from, you look at, they're just larger and larger categories. You know, football is a sport, and then a sport is a kind of like exercise. And so there's just different categories. And so that's the difference between arthropod and insect. My third and last question is, what is a complete metamorphosis and an incomplete metamorphosis <laughs> in your own words? In my own words? Um, and a complete metamorphosis, it would, be, would describe an insect that goes through very distinct changes in its life. Like the very hungry caterpillar turns from a caterpillar to a butterfly. The caterpillar looks so different from the butterfly and they even have separate functions. All a caterpillar does is eat. But there are some moths, they don't even have mouths. So you think that you ate, the, the moth only ate, and then the, no, the caterpillar only ate, and then the moth doesn't eat at all. So they're very divided up in very specialized phases in their life. Incomplete metamorphoses are kind of like humans almost, where they go through very gradual changes and the adult looks just a little bit different from the young. And so that would be an incomplete metamorphosis. So would you consider a caliper as a complete metamorphosis and a grasshopper as an incomplete metamorphosis? What was the first example? A caterpillar for the complete. Yes, yeah, 100%. You got it spot on. And a grasshopper for an incomplete metamorphosis. 100%, yep. Okay, thank you. Wow, great question, Mark. Um, do we have any other questions? I, I have a quick question. Can I ask one? All right. Um, I'm sorry, I missed uh, the beginning part of this panel, so I apologize if you already answered this. Uh, I, this is a question for Blake. Um, 
Are you familiar with the national, the, the recent, um, did you already talk about the recent survey about the um, extinction of bugs? Is that something that you were? <laughs> I didn't talk about it, no. Um, it's, uh, you're talking about like large scale insect declines? Yeah, there was a big cover article on National Geographic in, yes. uh, in May about it, about how there's a, a, a what they fear to be a mass extinction of bug life happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered if you were, you know, what your thoughts are on that, if that's something that you are, you know, thinking like that's something that needs to be combated, it's that sort of stuff. I will tell you, uh, so it's actually, I can answer that question with maybe something that would be relevant to, uh, to the group. So there are, uh, I had a whole presentation dedicated to the insect declines and it would, to talk about the entire thing would probably take us about an hour. We, we don't have that right now. But what's really relevant about that whole subject is the interaction between um, the, what's happening in, in the research, what's happening in the newspapers reporting it in the media, and then how the people are digesting that information. So there's multiple interactions and I think there's a great need for at least in my opinion, a better education of science in like elementary school and high schools so that people aren't necessarily relying on newspapers and National Geographic to interpret studies, they can do so themselves. So when it comes to these declines, they're based on a number of studies where the results are not very conclusive. They're very limited, but they had a 27 year old, a 27 year study for instance, I believe it was in Germany about insect declines and they were talking about insect biomass. Um, and that was very shocking and they did notice that. And, but some of the criticisms of that and what we talk about with scientific literacy is, is that applicable, is a German study applicable to the United States and is that applicable to what's going on in South America and Africa and Asia? They're very different environments. And so we would like that data to be replicable in different, to be replicated in different environments. And so they wanted to look at, you know, uh, and they had another study that came out afterward that tried to accomplish that, but they, only looked at terms, they basically were just like decline, insect, uh, their search terms were very limited, they were very like negative search terms. And that was what I think all the National Geographic article was based off of, it was almost this faulty search. And that was published. And so without understanding that and only reading the National Geographic article, you may feel like, oh shoot, things are really bad. But uh, people that were really scrutinizing that study, really read that study word for word, had a really strong grasp over how that study was conducted, were like, no, 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 this isn't the end of the story. And now recently in 2020, I, I believe it was um, last uh, April or last July, they published another one in America that showed that, at least in terms of what's going on in America, in the United States, that insects, some insects have gone down and some have gone up. And a lot of the aquatic insects are, are doing okay. They don't really understand why it's not, we're not seeing the same things that are going on in Germany, um, but it's different. So being able to break down those three different studies and understand what came out of it um, and how, because it's easy to react. Like, and another big thing that came out this year was the murder hornets. That if anyone heard about the murder hornets going on, that was a huge thing. The press completely destroyed what was really supposed to be going on. There's really only two colonies, maybe. When I heard about it down the grapevine, the press just really... They did not handle that well. And um, you're never going to find a murder hornet in Massachusetts. Simple as that. It's not going to happen. Um, and so uh, it's, it's kind of one of those things that uh, at least the insect declines is really hits on that point that what happens in National Geographic, the New York Times, Fox News, isn't necessarily what's going on in the research. And it's really important to, at least from my perspective, to understand that, that what you read in the news is not uh, representative of actual fact. Right, and, and, and so I went and looked, researched the art, the, it was um, in the Academy of Science, the initial article that came out in like 2019 and early 2020. So your advice is make sure that you're pairing one article with, and that was talking about like the, the mass extinction, like the, the sixth mass extinction and putting bugs as part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so is that something, so that idea of bugs being part of large-scale extinctions happening is still up for grabs for a lot of scientists? 
it's an unknown. It's, it's one of those, it, like right now there's been a lot of press saying it's a, it's like people think it's definite. It's like for sure it's really happening, but there are a lot of different factors that make it really, really complicated. I do think that any decline is, is bad no matter what, even if it's not this mass extinction, even if it's just a very subtle decline, it's bad. But uh, a lot, at least when you, when I'm looking at this research, I'm not looking at just a single study, even though that single study might show very precipitous declines. If there's other evidence that kind of shows that that's not really going on, you need to take that all into per perspective. Um, and so at least for me, um, I've only, I've probably only read about, um, maybe 12 different studies on this. So even me, I, I'm not an expert in the field. Um, but at least what I've read, it shows that it's very murky what's actually going on. We, we don't really know. Um, with more studies kind of hedging towards the declines and some saying that's not really declining. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, let me jump in at this point because uh, we're at 8.15. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to our panelists. Megan, Mariani, Lee, and Blake. Um, it was great to have you here. But more importantly, I really want to give a round of applause to our three moderators. Um, I know none of them have ever before done anything like this. And so we had a couple of coaching sessions over the past week. And I, I know the three of them to be quick learners. So I actually did not have any hesitation to do this tonight. I knew that they would be able to pull together some phenomenal questions <laughs> and uh, be really cool, except they could have smiled a little bit more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now they're smiling. Look at that, because it's almost over. Awesome um, job. <laughs> they really did. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> you three make me very proud. Thank you. Um, any final words um, from any of the panelists or, um, yeah, let's go with the panelists first. Any, any final comments from Megan, Mariani, Lee, or Blake? Uh, I just want to thank you for the invite. And again, um, my panel, my fellow panelists, uh, you know, all of us, I'm very sure we share. So impressed with all of you and just keep at it, folks. You know, someone mentioned failure. Remember, if you want to be a scientist, you, you're going to fail, um, and that's part of the process. Please don't get stuck, um, and don't give up. Again, you know, you'll you'll make your way through if it's something you're interested in. And again, there's so many opportunities in these fields. Don't you know? Don't go at it with blinders. You just heard a whole nother. I, uh, when Blake was just discussing that, I just thought of a whole nother realm that we work with a lot in my industry, and that's science communication and translation which is really a combination of understanding the technical part, but being able to translate it and explain it in fashions that are so important. So again, every door, has, you, know, you will see um, somewhere that you could potentially use your STEM interest and background. So just keep at it. Um, and certainly thank you again for this opportunity. And I, it, this was just, it was great to see and hear some of you and the questions were, Awesome. And Mark, you did, you, you posed some really tough questions to Blake and <laughs> I was very impressed. Thank you. Yeah, that's because he didn't uh, pose any difficult questions to you, huh? I know. <laughs> I'm sure he'll come up with one if you give him a second. <laughs> um, I, I want to jump in and say one thing. Um, any, actually, I'm not sure these three students, maybe Stephanie um, have, has heard me say this before. But in terms of failure, and, you know, failure is another way of, you know, just determining that something hasn't worked. Um, and, you know, I'm always quoting Thomas Edison, who said uh, this first 699 times he tried to discover, you know, light in the light bulb um, didn't work. But the 700th time actually did. And that's a quote from him. And that's, uh, you know, very seriously how many times it took him to discover the light bulb. So, Mariani, Lee, Blake, any final words? Yeah, I'll say something. Um, one of the things I want to kind of put out there is that I work for the county. And so you guys are, are from Brockton. You're in Plymouth County. Uh, 
But if you guys need anything, if you guys want any like recommendations on stuff, if you guys want to continue this discussion with me afterward, that's part of my job. So if you guys want to, you can always feel free. You can get my contact information from Pat and uh, my email address. Um, I used to interact with another kid from Brockton, Scotty Hugh Benny, and he was a great kid. Um, I even wrote him like a recommendation for a, a camp that he went to. And so any of that stuff, if you guys are thinking about, you don't have to like bugs, don't get me wrong. If you just want to go to biology, I'm really happy to help with any of that and continue that discussion. Uh, or, um, you know, not, I'm, I'm a biologist. So that's, and, you know, I'm an entomologist and a biologist. So that if you wanted to go into that field, I'm really happy to help you get your feet wet and uh, give you some tips on, on what you can do going forward. And he's got a really great idea for a science fair project because um, I guess <laughs> oh, yeah. mos mosquitoes can breed in a, um, a cup from, I mean, a, a cap from a bottle, bottle cap. Yeah, that's a good example. So this is something that's been kind of touted in the, in the world of mosquito control is that they always say mosquitoes can breed in a cap full of water. And this is just to kind of show you how little people know. No one's ever run that study. No one, right today, no one has ever published a study showing that that is possible. And it's literally just, you could just take a bottle cap, put it outside and see if mosquitoes breed in that. And that is something that no one else knows. It's all computer simulated data. So there's a heck of a lot of stuff out there that people do not know about. So if you're looking for projects, anything like that, I just have tons, I, do, I just sit here and I think of weird science stuff. That's just who I am. So feel free to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Anything um, else there? Uh, I, was, uh, I, I just want to say thank you all. <laughs> Go ahead, Lee. <laughs> Go first. <laughs> I was I was just going to say, you know, I I am also impressed by the number of, of of folks attending, and you know, as a as a young kid, I had some interest in STEM, but um, you know, I it's 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 easy to get discouraged. I would say follow your passion. Um, if you're interested, look for look for you know things that you can do. There's there's opportunities you know even in your backyard to 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 look at bugs to to breed mosquitoes in, in bottle caps. I would say there are lots of things to to feed your passion, and so don't don't lose focus of that, and um, you know keep keep moving forward. Mariani. Yes, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Thank you for hosting. And I want to thank our moderators for doing a great job moderating. Um, I think this is very important because it's good to expose the STEM fields. And I feel like I learned a lot. <laughs> so I know you guys have probably learned a lot too about different fields and different things people do. And if anyone is doing a coding science project, they, you guys can reach out to me and I'll be happy to help you code or debug or make a robot move, anything of those sorts. Or if you have like a biology coding project, I'll help you with the coding and then you can teach me more about biology. Either hmm. or. Yeah, I'm sure Isabel will be contacting you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's learning machine language, machine oh. learning stuff. Yeah. Yes, I can help you with machine learning. The next wave, and Evanji was talking about learning Python, and that was something that I suggested to him over the summer. It's like, you know, you learn Python, get the basics of it, and it's going to open up an awful lot of doors for you. And I'm very pleased to hear that um, he's either taking my suggestion or is just saying that's making me happy. <laughs> <laughs> and to um, put more emphasis, it's very true. A lot of scientists, research scientists are learning Python and they come to me and they're like, all right, I have the script. It's just this right here don't work. And I was like, whoa, this is very intense Python script. And it's, it's a new wave of Python and R. R is different, but Python is the one I'm more used to but it's like a different wave of coding and science mixed together. So it's true. Um, I have the contact info for, you know, everybody who was on both panels tonight. 
Um, they've all sent me emails and info in the chat saying, if any of you would like to connect with any of these uh, scientists or researchers, uh, please let me know and I'll be happy to connect you with them. Catherine, did you have something yes. to say? Um, yeah, just quick. Um, I work with the uh, Southeast Mass STEM Network. There are nine networks in Massachusetts. And this, as Pat mentioned, is STEM Week. And just in Southeast Mass, there's over 75 events going on this week. Um, I've had the good fortune to drop in on a number of them. Um, and without a doubt, these career panels tonight are just um, above the grade. Uh, this was an outstanding event. Uh, Pat did a fantastic job, as she always does. And the panel moderators and the panelists were outstanding. Um, I will contact Pat uh, about uh, perhaps sending you some info. Uh, we are having an advisory board meeting November 16th, and uh, some of you might want to join because along with promoting STEM careers and STEM education, um, we also have a commitment to uh, increasing the diversity of students who um, are prepared for rigorous STEM studies. And so I'm sure each of you could um, help us move that agenda forward. But this was exceptional, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate your uh, support. But I gotta tell you, tonight's panel was a result of our three moderators because I challenged them to come up with, you know, types of scientists that they wanted me to try to bring into the panels. And this, you know, the first thing was um, Ivanji with, ah, you know, I want someone who's doing marine biology. <laughs> and then it just continued on from there. Of course, nobody asked about um, insects, Blake, I'm sorry. However, <laughs> I know how great you are with doing your presentation. Blake has been at the last two STEM Week events that we had um, at the Brockton Public Library, and everybody went over to his table. He had a display of, you know, butterflies and all sorts of other bugs, which is why I stayed away from his table. Um, <laughs> but I've got some great photos of you. Um, I think that does it for us. I was really pleased to see that um, uh, school superintendent, uh, Mike Thomas from uh, the Brockton Public Schools um, was on for quite some time, um, had some nice words to say after. He had uh, a parent teachers conference online tonight uh, with a couple of his uh, children. So <laughs> this time was a little bit divided, but I know he wanted to participate. He really believes in what we're trying to do here. Um, and it was great. And thank you all, um, Mark and Warren Dean, again, your questions as they have been the last couple of days were absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I really do appreciate that. And again, um, hats off to our three moderators. The, the three of them are just absolutely incredible to work with. Um, and a super thanks also to Jacobs um, who uh, is a, a company that, a uh, global company that is involved in um, a lot of infrastructure and wastewater. I know Leah's part of Jacobs, but um, they've been uh, supporters of this STEM week activity and we seriously really appreciate it. So th Leah, if you could, you know, pass on, you know, our thanks to the rest of the crew. Um, it, it's really greatly appreciated. Any final words? If not, going once. <laughs> going twice. Can I go have dinner now? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. All right. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Bye.